Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, be sure to uh, cast your vote for the show on uh, Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net, and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, after uh, September 3rd, Edmund O'Brien... Uh, left the show Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, on September 3rd, and Johnny Dollar left the air until uh, around Thanksgiving, when it returned on November 28th of 1952, with John Lund in the lead role. Lund, unlike O'Brien, wasn't really a star of any sort. He was in 25 movies between uh, 1946 and 1957, and then another two in the 1960s. As far as we can tell, he never made a television appearance and never had a really uh, breakout movie that made him a star. For CBS, that meant he was going to be there pretty uh, consistently. He was a respected... Uh, actor. He was uh, vice president of the Screen Actors Guild uh, during most of the 1950s. But he wasn't someone whose uh, rising stardom would have him uh, taken away from the show. He was someone who was steady, reliable, he was going to be there. And he was a capable actor of both stage, screen, and radio. With a lot of appearance on anthology shows such as Family Theater and Suspense. If there's anything that uh, Lund was perhaps noteworthy for, it was that he probably had a more uh, happy and peaceful life uh, than nearly any of the other actors to play uh, Johnny Dollar. He had uh, one marriage that lasted 39 years. He had the respect of his uh, peers and retired in 1963 for a second uh, successful career in business and outlived all of the other actors who played uh, Johnny Dollar, uh, dying in 1992 at the ripe old age of 81. Uh, for many uh, listeners, John Lund is not their favorite Johnny Dollar. Indeed, when the Nostalgia page uh, did a uh, poll of their listeners to get the favorite Johnny Dollar, like Charles Russell, Lund got zero votes. In his book on the Who is uh, Johnny Dollar matter, uh, John Abbott said that uh, Lund's portrayal of Dollar was boring. And his initial uh, evaluation of Dollar, Jib Widner of the uh, Radio Detective Story Hour was not a fan. However, Widner uh, came back recently and said that he found uh, Lund's portrayal of Dollar to be warm. And so we'll decide for ourselves over the next uh, 70 odd weeks as we listen to John Lund as uh, Johnny Dollar. Well, our first uh, episode, this one's going to require a little bit of work on our part uh, because it's not, a, a, in one way, a full episode. It is John Lund's audition for the role of Johnny Dollar. And a lot of OTR sites date this, uh, uh, this is a pilot for the serialized version of Johnny Dollar, which would come around a little less than three years uh, after Johnny Dollar returned in a half-hour time slot. In the 15-minute serial version of Johnny Dollar, the way that the, uh, the serial version worked was that Monday through Friday, a 15-minute episode would air each day. For the audition, they expanded an episode, The Trans-Pacific Matter, from 1950, into a ser into a bit of a serial, and they actually only expanded the beginning and the end. So all we have, uh, and all that was ever produced, was part was the part one part and the part five part. But there's no parts missing. It's, it's just the way it was recorded. If you get confused at all, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to the Trans Pacific uh, Export Matter. It was episode two seventy five, and um, we did that in uh, November of two thousand and ten. Uh, before we do get started with today's episode, I do want to encourage you as you make your travel plans as uh, holidays coming up, uh, remember JohnnyDollarAir.com. It's powered by Priceline, which allows you to save money either by naming your own price or choosing from great published fares. Plus, you can save even more 
by getting a vacation package which combines say hotel and rental car or hotel rental car and airline ticket and it helps to support the great detectives of old time radio so here from sometime in November of 1952 is the Trans-Pacific Export Matter with John Lund from Hollywood, it's time now for John Lund as Johnny Dollar. Al Harper at Corinthian, Johnny. I have a case here you won't like, but the commission will be good if we beat it. How big is the policy? Two hundred thousand dollars. I, uh, I'm afraid to tell you the rest. Why? It's in Hong Kong. You'll have to travel. Well, you haven't scared me yet. Is there something you're leaving out? Policyholders are people we've had trouble with before. Remember the Trans-Pacific Import-Export Outfit? Yeah. I sent flowers to the widow. Trans-Pacific was in Shanghai then. This is their Hong Kong place. Want to take a crack at it? No. But I will. Good. Al. Yeah? I'm scared now. Tonight and every weekday night, John Lund in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Corinthian Liability and Risk, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Trans-Pacific matter. I found Hong Kong to be a city without simplicity, burdened with the tragic complexities of war. To fill the smallest want is a difficult and almost always expensive task. There's a shortage of everything, food, water, help, places to live. Both the island and the city of Kowloon on the mainland burst with thousands of refugees who have moved from the interior. Over the bobbing head of my rickshaw boy, I watched many of them lining the streets wailing for arms as we made our way to the offices of the American consulate. It is true. Life is very difficult here. Where are they all going? Many of them do not know. Where is the foreign to go? What do they do? How do they stay alive? Many of them do not. It is not like this in your America? No. Has it ever been? Well, there was a civil war once. The books I read say that at times it was pretty bad. But not like this. Never. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Grover. Louisa, would you ask Mr. Dollar to step in, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Grover is ready to speak with you. Thanks. Well, Hartford, Connecticut, huh? This sounds foreign. Mm, I suppose it would. Yeah, it's a pleasure, Mr. Dollar. Same here, Mr. Grover. Yeah, sit down. Yeah, insurance investigation, huh? Yes. Well, now, what's your errand and what can this office do for you? I'm here to investigate a claim filed by the Trans-Pacific Import-Export Company. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Will Meadows' firm. Uh, destroyed by fire last month. One hundred percent. Or two hundred thousand dollars worth to my company. Do you uh, know this William Meadow, Mr. Grover? Well, I met him at the American Club now and then. That's about all. Hey, insurance investigators are hired when... When the company isn't satisfied with something about the claim... On this one, the fire was blamed on vandalism. Well, vandalism has become quite a popular pastime, Cross and Kowloon especially. Do you suspect some sort of fraud? Frankly, we do, Mr. Grover. Trans-Pacific once had a branch in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. When the war closed in on them up there, their warehouse burnt to the ground, just like this one here. I see. And it occurred to a number of people in my home office that Trans-Pacific did much better by collecting on the insurance at that time than by going through the expense of liquidating. Mm hmm I suppose coincidence won't quite do it, will it? Well, now, how can I help you? Well, I'd appreciate some phone calls or letters that would give me some support from the fire department, the police. Mm-hmm. 
I don't suppose my problem seems very important out here. Well, just thinking that very thing. It's always the case, Mr. Dollar, on the fringe of war, very few individual problems seem very important. Nor are the individuals themselves in the end. I trust you'll keep that in mind as you conduct your investigation here, huh? I'll try to. Uh, getting help, even time from the police or fire brigade, is one of those individual problems, but I'll do what I can for you. Well, anything will help, Mr. Grover. I uh, won't take up any more of your time. Hey, uh, elections must have been quite exciting back home, huh? Oh, yes, they were. I miss that part of home very much. Oh, be sure to leave your number with my girl. I'll let you know about the official assistant. Well, I came right here from the airport. I don't have a number yet. Oh, well. Pretty tough? Yes. As a matter of fact, almost impossible. The Occidental places are always filled. It, I'll tell you, you speak with my receptionist, Miss Vadris. Vadris? Yes, her father's half Portuguese. He might have accommodations. She's a charming girl. They're nice people. Oh, good. I'll ask her. And uh, thanks again. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar, uh, just a matter of interest. Yes? The case of the Trans-Pacific import in Shanghai. You say your company was forced to meet the claim there? That's right. Was it investigated? The investigator they sent over was killed before he could build a case. Oh. They blamed his death on war conditions, too. They said he was robbed and knifed by starving refugees. Nobody had time to dig up the truth. Miss Vadris arranged for accommodations at her father's place on a street called Sing Wong, a hill of steps that climbs from the waterfront to the plush European residences on the top of Victoria Peak. I had a room that looked out on an alley. There was an iron bed, a chair, and a pitcher of water on a bamboo table. There were no other non-Orientals in the building, but I seemed to be the only one that noticed it. The first night there, I was suffering from a combination of claustrophobia and loneliness. Feelings which at first made me glad to learn that it was she who knocked at my door. Hello, Miss Vedras. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Grover contacted a man named Harrison. He's at the fire control office here. Oh, Mr. Grover asked me to tell you that Mr. Harrison will see you tomorrow morning. Oh, that's good. Uh, won't you come in? Are you comfortable? Oh, thank you. Yes, I am. This is fine. I, uh, I don't have much to offer you. Cigarette? Scotch? Uh, no, no, thank you. I am very curious. About what? Why you are here? Business, if that's what you mean. It's uh, better kept confidential right now. Is there danger in this business? Why do you ask that? Because you are followed here, and you are being watched. How do you know? Oh, I know Sing Wong Street. I have seen this man, but not here. Where is he? Perhaps you can see him from the window. Wait a minute. You tell me where he is. I'll look. The shop on the other side. There are boxes piled near the door. Yeah. You say you've seen him. Where? I kind of remember that. I have just seen him. Uh-huh. Well, no need to worry. There won't be any trouble here. You seem sure of that. I have the advantage right now. He doesn't know that I know he's there. Well, thanks for telling me about him. Perhaps you know who he is. No. I didn't think anybody knew I was in town. You will let us go on the watching? Hmm. Not much choice. But uh, let's talk about something else, huh? What's that music? Oh, that is love song. Two lonely people who meet near a river. Oh. In America, the songs are different. Oh, yes, I know. I like them. Do you know uh, many Americans? Oh, yes. At the consulate office, I see them all the time. I want to marry one. Well, I'd say he was a very lucky American. <laughs> you misunderstand. I do not mean there's only one. I want to marry an American who would take me from China. There is no other way. You hate it that much? There's nothing else to do but hate it. 
There's no good here, always trouble. The Chinese are a patient people, but I'm not all Chinese. And I cannot make myself be patient any longer. I want to go to America where people thrive on impatiency. You know, I would think from what I've seen of them, the Americans are the most impatient people in the world. They say we kill ourselves that way. Heart and stomach. But still you live longer and better. Uh, what about your Portuguese people? Oh, they're gone. You think I'm bad to be this way? Oh, no. No, I didn't say that. I'm not bad. I hope you find your American, Miss Vedras. If you want me to go now. Well, I, I think you'd better. I'll see you tomorrow. Yes. Good night. Three things interfered with sleep that night. The pleading in the eyes of the girl. The smells and sounds that drifted into my room from the restless, crowded city. And the watcher, who was still at his station across the street when I turned out my light. The toughest part of the case was that failure in Shanghai where the agent had been killed. There was a sobering memory. And for that reason, every face on Sing Wong Street was a suspicious one. In every group of Hong Kong Chinese, a potential assassin, with my watcher the first to be reckoned with. Gun in hand, eyes on the street, I fell asleep that night, watching him. The next morning, there was a different man in his place. I was followed to the office of Harrison, the chief of the fire brigade. Who had developed couldn't see me after all. So, with a morning on my hands, I decided to talk to William Meadow, the head of Trans-Pacific. Oh, yes, sir. Mr. Meadow at home? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, you give name, please. Who is it, Lim? Uh, American gentleman. Uh, my name is Dollar, Mr. Meadow. I'm from Corinthian Liability, Hartford office. All the way from the States? That's right. Let him in, Lim. Oh, you come in, please. What did you say your name was? Dollar. Now, what's the matter with that company, anyway? This doesn't have to be unpleasant, Mr. They sit Mr. back Meadow. there in Hartford with nothing to worry about but Sunday's golf game. They don't know anything about the conditions we're working under. They do know that your fire here pretty much follows the pattern of the one in Shanghai. And of course it does. The conditions are the same. Including the starving refugees to kill and rob the investigator? I tell you this now. Careless people are dying here every day. It can happen pretty easy. Now, say what you have to say to me and get out of here. It's very little, Mr. Meadow. I came here mainly to get my reaction to you. I have. You jumped to the conclusion that you were under suspicion before I got through that door. You're on the defensive, so you must have a reason to be. Show him out, Lee. Oh, you come now, Mr. Dollar. Wait. More important, you're having me followed. So you must be afraid oh, of please, me. Please, Mr. Dollar. Hold on. I'm not afraid of you, Dollar, or what you can find, or what you might try to do. Corinthian liability means no more to me than a bill I authorized payment on at the beginning of the year. My firm burned down here, and that dandy little company of yours is going to pay the claim. True, I don't like you snooping around. I don't like you coming here to my house like this. You know it. No man would. That's the biggest parcel of information you'll ever get from me. Then I'll go elsewhere. Good idea. Have your dreams, Dollar, but have them someplace else. Go snoop through the ashes. They're cold, mainly. Just get out of here. Oh, now, Mr. Dollar, please. I can find the door. Two things came out of that conversation with William Meadow. One, a reasonable platform to build a suspicion on. Two... A veiled threat in his reference to the agent who had been killed in Shanghai. Let me elaborate on that. Most all of what Meadows was saying to me was, this is my town and I run things. Anybody who gets in my way can get hurt. Hmm. It was a real nice situation, all right. I'd been threatened and I was being followed. Expense account item two, seven dollars for scotch. 
I rickshawed back to my hotel, locked myself in, and took up my vigil by the window. Same watcher, same kind of night. In a city where life was supposedly so cheap, mine began to grow expensive. Be sure to hear tomorrow's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring John Lund, who can currently be seen in the Universal International picture just across the street. Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar is written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter and is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Dan Coverley, inviting you to join us every day, Monday through Friday, when John Lund appears as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, you meet adventure when you meet Johnny Dollar on the CBS Radio Network. From Hollywood, it's time now for John Lund as Johnny Dollar. This is Grover, American Consulate. Oh, hi. I'm back in my office. Do you know why? Why? Because Superintendent Clyde of the Hong Kong Police telephoned me. He's very upset over your attitude, asked me to speak with you. I told him I did speak to you earlier tonight, warned you to be cautious. I've been cautious, Mr. Grover. I just scalped a two-bit thug that William Meadow had on me. The next one on my list is Meadow himself. What do you think of that? Dollar, use your head. Look. Meadow's claim on his warehouse is no good. He hasn't liked me peeking around proving it's no good. Louisa Vedras was killed by him or one of his men because they thought it was me. And something's got to be done about it. Well, I agree, but will you come over and talk first? All right, Mr. Grover. But don't try to stop me. Tonight and every weekday night, John Lund in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Fifth day in Hong Kong. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Corinthian Liability and Risk, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of additional expenditures during my investigation of the Trans-Pacific matter. Expense account item 14. $48 American. Rental on 35 Packard. I got tired of rickshaws. But I had a hard time driving through the Hong Kong streets. Anybody would. They were still jammed with humanity. Humanity on the verge of panic. Humanity living on the edge of a war. Only thing I could say for that Packard was that the horn worked beautifully. And hardly anybody paid any attention to it. Took me an hour to get to Grover's office. He gave me a drink and listened to my story. Are you sure this man who's been following you is in the employ of uh, William Meadow? Positive, he told me. Yeah, but under uh, duress. He had a knife and a gun on him. Sure, I'd arrest him. I'd duress anybody with that kind of equipment, Mr. Grover. Wouldn't you? Uh, Calm down, calm down. You've got a point, boy. Here, have another. Thanks. Well, what about Meadow? You say you're going after him. What do you mean? Just that. I'm going to get him. Yeah, you said that. But let me ask you something else. Is it for your insurance company or because of Louisa's death? This is for my own information, Dollar. Louisa and I got to know each other pretty well during the first three days I was here. I don't quite know how it happened. This has been a bad job for the nerves with my mind on what happened to the man in Shanghai and all. Mm -hmm. She got me the room at her father's hotel. She was there when I came back after a pretty bad day. 
I didn't know who was following me. And I guess I needed somebody to be with. So she stayed for a while. And she was there the next night, waiting for me in the room. And she was waiting for me to come back the night she was killed. That answers me. Don't you see? They killed her thinking it was me. You're sure of that? Of course. As sure as if I'd had a camera on the whole thing. But I can't move these police here. I can't get them to do anything. Yeah, you don't understand these people here. They have to be caught. Well, I don't. Not anymore. Look, I can't come into her life for two days and be responsible for her death and then not do anything about it. So you're going after Meadow? That's right. Well, I promised I wouldn't try to stop you. Yeah, thanks. But be careful. I'm glad he didn't say cautious. I had a big hate on for the word when I crawled back into the rented Packard and headed toward the south part of town where Meadow lived. Meadow? Open up! Somebody open up or I'll shoot this lock off. Oh, who is it? It's Mr. Dollar. I've been here before. Open the door. Let me in. Hurry up. Oh, you wait. Oh, hello, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Mr. Meadow, he's not here. You come back next week. Oh, no, please, please, you wait. Uh, Mr. Meadow, he's not here, I tell you. Close the door. Oh, Mr. Meadow, he's not here. Meadow! Meadow! He's not here. You come back, huh? Where is he? Oh, he say he come back next week. Uh, you come back then. Uh, he see you then. Now you go home. Look, I've got to find him. If you know where he is, tell me. Oh, he come back next week. Now listen. I don't want to hurt you. Do you understand? Oh, do not hurt. But I will hurt plenty if I don't find out where he is. It's important. Now tell me. Where is he? Oh, he say not to tell anybody. Tell me. Oh, Mr. Meadow, he fire me if I tell. Tell me. Oh, all right. Oh, he go Kowloon. Kowloon, eh? Oh, yes. Uh, Kowloon. Uh, you find him there. Then you go with me. If he's not there, then I hurt. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, once more. Oh. Once more. I have to find him. Where is he? Uh, all right. I, I tell you. Uh, Repulse Bay. What? Uh, Repulse Bay. Repulse Bay? On the other side of the island? Where the big hotel is? Oh, yes. Uh, he there. Can I call him there on the telephone? Yes, you call is he at the hotel? Oh, no, no, he had a cottage, uh, number seven, uh, last one. Where's the telephone? Oh, oh please, oh, you will not tell how you learn it up, please. No. Oh, telephone. Call the number. Oh, I no talk. I'll talk. Go ahead. Repulse Bay Hotel? Oh, oh, Mr. Meadow Cottage, please. Okay, give it to me. Hello? 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 Oh, you see, I tell truth, uh, he there. You did fine. Oh, you, you go see? Yeah. You no tell? No, I won't tell. But it won't make any difference anymore. Oh, no, understand, Mr. Dollar. You will. Hong Kong Police Department. I want to talk to the superintendent. Yes, sir. Hold on. Superintendent Clyde, yeah? Will you believe a confession from William Meadow? What? Who is this? Mr. Dollar? Yeah. What is this about a confession? Meadow's going to make one. Oh, now, see here. He's at Repulse Bay, Cottage 7. I'm going there now. If you want that confession, have some men there. Outside in an hour. And quiet till it's finished. I warn you, Dollar. Any illegalities on your part will be answered for. Oh, you go now, Mr. Dollar, huh? Yeah. I go now. The packer got me there in 40 minutes. And I was in front of Cottage 7 when the police car slid in with lights and motors turned off. Yeah. Let's get away from the house. Oh. Uh, Dollar, we came here not because of what you said on the phone about getting a confession, but to see to it that nothing happens here that would better be prevented. Oh, thank you. Uh, wait. 
Now, I have no reason to arrest you right now, but I will, and I mean it, if you do anything out of line. Well, then keep an eye on me. You're a hot-headed, impetuous man. My department and I have stood for all of the insults and badgering we will from you. I thought Mr. Grover made that clear to you. Mr. Grover told me you had to be cautious. And we do. Your case against William Meadow is nothing but notarized statements from people who could have said most anything. Well, your accusations as regards the murder of that poor girl bear consideration, but... They also are very inconclusive. But you haven't done anything about either. We do things our way, Mr. Dollar, in spite of your insurance company. There is no case against him. And why did he have me followed? Oh, did he? Some pug who was waiting for a chance at me. I shook him down two hours ago and found out Meadow hired him. Oh, that doesn't seem reasonable, Dollar. In light of what you said previously, if Meadow assumed you were the one shot behind the screen in your hotel room instead of the girl. No, it doesn't, except he found out the wrong person was killed. Doesn't any of this mean anything to you people? Well, we'd have to interview the man you were shook down. Where is he? In an alley on Sing Wong, for all I know. I left him cold. Well, Dollar, I'll make your play. What? We'll back you up. Go ahead. All of us seem to be flying blind. This might flush out some truth. I don't understand. I checked on you as investigator quite thoroughly. You have a reputation in your United States, an enviable one. I can't disregard that. Very well. We wait here and do what you can. Well, you put up a lot of fights, Superintendent. So do you. Good luck. Who is it? It's Dollar. Who? Dollar. You know I'm still alive. You know that girl was shot instead of me at the hotel room? I don't know anything. Meadow, I want you to go back to town with me and make a statement to the police. Are you crazy? Oh, no, I'm not crazy. I'm here to clear up two things, her murder and that fire. And you know I'm going to do it. Do I? I stopped that man you had following me. His statement will put you in plenty of hot water. Go away. I said I wanted you to come with me. I heard you. Will you come down or shall I come in? Come on in. We'll talk about it. It'll be a pleasure. Meadow? Meadow? No, you wouldn't take me down. <laughs> I hated you when you... <laughs> what? I, I, I hit you, didn't I? Oh, just in the arm. It'll be all right. It should have been your stomach. You're cashing in, Meadow. How about it? A statement. No. Tell it, Meadow, how you fired the warehouse. <laughs> And about the girl. It can't hurt you now. I'll tell you nothing. Dollar, you all right? Yeah. Meadow. Meadow. I should have got you it. <coughs> all right, Dollar. You better have that arm taken care of. Expense account item 15, $43 even, medical fees and hospital charges. I don't suppose it could be called hewing to the niceties of jurisprudence, since Meadow was dead and he refused before dying to speak or write his confession. But there were two police carloads of expert witnesses who took the fact that he had opened fire as an acceptable admission of guilt for the crimes accused. The same thing cleared me legally on the grounds of self-defense. I'd hoped it would clear my mind, but it hasn't. Louisa Vedras is still there. I guess she always will be. Nothing good came out of this assignment except saving your company some money it didn't know it had. 
Item 16, same as item 1, plane fare back to United States. Expense account total, $4,515. End of fifth day. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. John Lund can currently be seen in the Universal International picture just across the street. Featured in our cast were Joe Kearns, Lillian Baeff, Robert Griffin, and Bill Johnstone. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> This is Dan Coverley, inviting you to join us next Monday when John Lund appears as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And remember, you meet adventure when you meet Johnny Dollar on the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. Well, a decent performance by Lund here. Um, compared to the uh, previous version, I, I definitely do like the O'Brien uh, performance, but uh, I think definitely uh, going to be good to listen to, and the writing uh, continues to remain uh, at a high level. Though he did almost seem to lose it at one point uh, in, in, and crack up a, l- a little during uh, w- uh, one of the lines towards the end. Well, next week we'll, of course, be back to our normal uh, way of doing shows, and I hope this wasn't too disorienting. I think we'll only have one uh, other episode like this. It won't be during the Lund uh, era. Uh, for those of you who have the app or premium site, we're going to have an app uh, special featuring a Lux Radio Theater performance by John Lund uh, playing the role of Jim Bowie called The Iron Mistress, and that'll be your extra for today. In the meanwhile, if you have a comment, email to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Give us a call, 208-991-4783. Oh, I almost forgot. I have a listener comment on Podcast Alley. Uh, uh, excellent podcast, great host. Thank you so much. Appreciate your support. and encourage everybody to vote on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. Remember to take our listener survey, survey.greatdetectives.net. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.